evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our online sales conference event for sales and revenue leaders. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We'd love to know how you're getting on, um, why you've tuned in with us tonight. So please do get involved with our online chat and our online polls as well. So the theme of this evening's talks is very topical. We're going to be speaking about sales and marketing growth in a crisis. So we're all going through a really difficult time at the moment. So that's why I think it's really important to come together, share some knowledge and experience to help each other out. As we can't do that in person, we wanted to offer as close to that as possible. Um, so I'd really, really like to thank our incredible team at Sales Confidence. We've been working tirelessly hard in the background behind the scenes to make sure that this online event was possible. Um, so thank you very much. We hope that you can enjoy our events, but from the comfort of your own homes. So I hope you're having, you've had a great time meeting each other in the networking room and making some connections. But a little bit more about us at Sales Confidence. Um, so why we want to make this happen is because at Sales Confidence, our vision is to build the largest B2B sales community. And we elevate the sales profession and help support individuals at each stage of their career to be more successful. So we continue to deliver, deliver our events and we also have the Sales Confidence Membership. It's an annual learning and development membership where you have the access to the best mentors and coaches in the UK and global sales community. For those of you who haven't met yet, my name's Claire and I'm the Chief of Staff and Customer Success at Sales Confidence. I'll be hosting the event tonight, but I'm very, very excited to announce that we have some amazing speakers lined up for you. They have a wealth of knowledge and also some actionable tips for you to I would say take home with you tonight, but uh, you're probably already at home. But yeah, definitely some actionable tips for you to take into your careers in sales. They'll each be delivering um, a seven minute speech with their words of wisdom to share with you. And then at the end of the speeches, we'll open up to a panel so you can ask them questions using our online chat. So without further ado, um, we have our first speaker of the evening. This is Owen Richards. He's Managing Director at Air Marketing. They're all in partners for Sales Confidence and also for SaaS Growth, our event in July. Um, he is the founder and MD of Air Marketing. So Owen's guided Air to become a nationally recognized leader in the outsourced sales field, providing outsourced SDR services to dozens of clients internationally. Owen has built a high-performing outsourced sales team of more than 60 people with aggressive growth forecasted again for 2020. Air marketing generates millions of pounds of pipeline and revenue for its clients across EMEA and the US every year. Owen has over a decade's experience in delivering and executing outsourced sales and direct marketing strategies for clients across multiple industries, including global brands and a proven track record of rapidly driving business expansion and revenue growth within highly competitive industry sectors. Owen is also the founder of Roots to Market, a digital demand generation agency based in the UK. And Owen's passion lies in helping B2B sales organizations grow their market share and drive successful and innovative go-to-market strategies. His title for this evening is Whatever you do, don't stop selling. So please welcome to the stage, Owen. Introduction, some very kind words there. <clears throat> and wow, what a what a uh, what an unusual time to be speaking. I'm, I'm honored to be the first person to be doing this virtually at a, a leaders event and to be a speaker tonight. So thanks for thanks for inviting me along. Um, we're in uncertain times and I'm sure that everybody is going to touch on that tonight. Um, and there's a there's a there's a temptation to wonder whether we should be talking about sales in an environment like this. We've got health concerns, economy concerns, all sorts of worries and things to think about outside of selling. And of course, that means that you have to question whether sales is important at this time. Um, and the short answer for me is yes, we should be talking about, about sales. And I'm going to tell you why tonight. In uncertain times, there's a temptation to pull back. There's a temptation to look to hibernate, to slow down, to stop your sales efforts. 
Um, and what we have to understand is whilst that temptation is natural and we're all scared and we're all worried about what's going to happen, sales is still the lifeblood of our business. Whether that's new sales, whether that's cross-selling to your current customer base, upselling more work to them if they're in the right sort of sectors and in the right kind of space at the moment, whether that's winning new business, sales is sales and all of our businesses rely on it. Without sales, absolutely nothing exists. The bottom line is that at this time in particular, those that choose not to sell, those that choose not to be aggressive and remain, remain ambitious will get left behind. They may get left behind in the next six weeks, uh, in the next three months, in the next six months, none of us know how long the current state is going to go for. But I'll tell you one thing, they will get left behind. If businesses go out of business in the next few months, then that's because they won't be able to bring revenue in. For those that are fortunate enough to survive through these turbulent times, we will see a ramp up at some stage. We don't know how long, I don't know how long, you don't know how long, but at some stage, things will start to pick up. And if you are in an industry that's got a downturn now, those that are able to move fastest at that point will be the ones that get ahead and the ones that are most successful in the coming months and years. So instead of stopping fo focusing on sales, instead of slowing things down, focus on what you can do to set yourself up for that rebuild. First and foremost, your sales focus is if you can't sell in your market at the moment, and if you're not one of those lucky people that, that whose sales are going to rocket because of this, focus on pipeline first. So as I said, let's say this takes three months. In three months time, just as quickly as this got taken away from us, it was only seven a day, seven days ago, I was suggesting to my team that we do a road test of working everyone from home and people were laughing at me. Seven days later, everybody working from home. It will turn the other way just as fast. At some stage, something will happen that allows us to, to switch everything back on. And if you're not ready to go, if you have a standing start instead of a running start, you'll get left behind. Right now, you need to be focusing on pipeline. If you can sell now and get deals over the line, that's great. If you can be positioning people through a positive mindset to be ready to go when the time is right, you will be hot off mark when things turn. You need to change your messaging. Think about the way that you can change the way you talk. Think about the, the, the way that you can ch change your message to resonate with people's emotions and people's feelings at the moment test different channels at this time and this hurts me to say it the phone is a tough channel people are less contactable at the moment that doesn't mean they're not on a phone but think about if you're not already doing it integrating into video into social into email all of these things are viable channels we've had some huge success with video prospecting personalized video uh, pitches going out to prospects via social and via email using platforms like vidyard um, personalized outreach via LinkedIn and email becomes even more critical in these times. But remember that what we're in now is a state of panic, a state of, state of shock. And some point, some point people are going to realize that if this is going to be a sustained way of working, they're going to have to adapt. They're going to have to change and they're going to have to be contactable. People are still on their phones. LinkedIn is going mad over the last few days. They're still working. And of course, they still need to sell their products. They still need to operate. They still need to service their customers and clients. So people will still be working and looking to earn money, which means that you can connect with them. You just have to find the way to do that. You're not going to get that right straight away. But like with any new market, any new approach, it's trial and error. Test things, but keep focusing on selling. Do not take the foot off the gas. Just change the direction in which you're traveling. One piece of advice for everybody at the moment, don't focus on selling on based on coronavirus or COVID-19. Yes, we all need to touch on that, but we don't want to be seen to be capitalizing on others' failure or others' losses. But instead, just preempt the concerns around that. Get people to understand that you're aware of it, you've got some recommendations and, and some expertise. We're looking for people to instill confidence in us at the moment. If salespeople are confident and positive, we'll go on that journey with them. If they are negative and down and they're suggesting that things aren't going to work out soon, we won't buy into them and we won't see their message as viable. So stay positive and be the expert. Even if you feel nervous about the times, be the expert and be making commercial recommendations around timeframes, around how to get everything set up. Only today we want a new client and our, our messaging has shift from, shifted from 
yes, buy from us, and we want to go get going as soon as possible, to yes, buy from us, let's get everything ready so that we can hit the button when we feel that time is right. That's a change of message for us, but it's working and it's giving people the confidence that we can be ready to go as soon as they're ready to go. We've adapted our offering to the market and that's making a huge difference to the way that we're connecting with people. In times like this, it's also important that you focus on your personal brand and also your business's brand if you're in, in, in working in collaboration with your marketing team or indeed you're involved in that piece of your business. We want to hear positive stories. We want to hear success stories. If you're shouting about all the things that you're doing well, all the things that you're adapting to, all the things that you're changing to make work, I'm going to listen to that. I'm going to sit up and pay attention. And when the time comes that I'm ready to do something, you're going to be top of mind. If you're quiet, if you're focusing on other things, if you go missing, you're not going to be top of mind. And I'm going to go to one of your competitors. And I'll come back to the point. Those that sell most ambitiously and that remain positive and who focus on continuing to, to keep their foot on the gas with sales over the coming months will be the people who are most ready if and when that time is right. And when that time comes, you want to be having a running start, not a standing start, because people are going to be crying out for your help at that point. And at that point, you need to be absolutely ready. So look, it's short and sweet today. I know we only have a sev seven minutes. We can talk forever and a day about what you should and shouldn't be doing. But I hope that there's some advice in there that gives you the confidence to keep going to market, keep backing yourself and remain confident because sales are still there to be won. And whatever you do, don't stop selling. Thank you very much, Owen. Some wise words there from you. Um, now, our next speaker was supposed to be Bridget Fox uh, from Totem, but she's had to go home back up to Leeds to look after her mum. So next up, we have our third speaker of the evening, it's Jer Jerry Hill. Now, Jerry serves as VP for EMEA for Connect and Sell. He is a revenue strategist and sales scientist, helping companies design sustainable and repeatable go-to-market processes and strategies. He has independently consulted to and served over 28 companies in the past five years, helping them achieve breakthrough growth and investment goals. Before that, he has sat in chief revenue officer seat for two pre-revenue companies, taking them from zero money to seven figure ARR in less than 24 months. He has also founded and failed at one tech company and Jerry started his formal career in sales at 15 years old, peddling sportswear at his local branch of Intersport on his high street. He is currently serving on the advisory board of two UK-based technology scale-ups uh, alongside building Connect and Sales business in Europe. So be keeping very busy. His title for this speech this evening is Defensive and Offensive Plays to Help Manage Your Revenue in a Crisis. So please join me in welcoming Jerry to the stage. Thanks very much for that, Claire. Um, firstly, I, I loved everything that Owen had to say. Um, there was a lot of empathy, a lot of emo emotional intelligence about a lot, what a lot of us are feeling right now. Um, I took a note and the first thing that I sort of suddenly thought when Owen was sort of discussing the reason to be in motion today is this, what you do today is the future health of your company. So there is a reason to be in conversation with your market. The second thing that I absolutely love from him is you have an opportunity to be the expert and not the salesperson. And that links into something that I'll speak about in a bit more detail shortly. Um, some research of my fellow panelists this evening shows that I am the grandfather tonight. Um, in fact, I think it's only Geraldine and me who are speaking this evening who worked in the front line through the last great recession. So I'm definitely showing my age. Um, I believe there are a lot of lessons learned though during that period, which I can bring forward into the conversation we're having tonight. Um, before I go on my five minute gallop on tactics, I just quickly wanted to characterize what I believe this crisis means right now for revenue leaders. And maybe this perspective will, will sort of sharpen some swords for some of you. We are in a situation which either keeps sellers at home or reduces vendor access to customer sites. Developing and deploying approaches that penetrate these new barriers 
without losing the human touch is essential for sales success, revenue continuity. But more importantly, for a lot of us in this group, business survival. One book I can consistently refer back to and reread is The Hard Things About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz, principal at the legendary VC firm in the Bay Area, Anderson Horowitz. Two statements he discussed in the book set the scene for what a number of us will be experiencing for the first time professionally. And I think both of these statements will speak to you as a leader and what your potential relationship to your CEOs will be like in the coming days and weeks. The first is this. Peacetime CEO strives to tolerate deviations from the plan when coupled with effort and creativity. Wartime CEO is completely intolerant. The second one is this. Peacetime CEO aims to expand the market softly and gently. Wartime CEO aims to win the market or risk going out of business. I feel it'll be interesting to gauge at some point either this evening or after tonight, what people's reaction to these statements are, how it makes you feel, and whether or not they align to either align to whether you are either war or peace by nature, crisis or calm. It's in this context, I have 10 thoughts on what you can do tactically to get through a crisis. Some of these ideas are offensive, so to attack, and some are defensive to protect and conserve your position and they are in no particular order of priority. The first is this, embrace your existing customers early and now. It's important that you understand the value provide and whether you consistently align your service or product to their mission critical business requirements. Your existing customers are generally easier to sell to and retention should be a big focus on your time and effort at the moment. Mobilize your success teams and executive leaderships into your key accounts to ensure revenue continuity. Number two, figure out where your services are nice to have versus must have and place your next bets on the types of customers and value where you can align to, align to wartime needs. To apply some context to this, I went out for a drink with a good friend of mine last week who is a senior finance executive at a Fortune 20 company. He described that he is currently analyzing every cost in the business and reporting on it daily to the CFO and CEO. In his words, if you can't save us money or really accelerate revenue growth with no additional cost attached, we will scrutinize why we need you and stop doing business with you. Number three, and dearest to my heart, always be prospecting. Keep speaking to your market and get signals early on from that market as to where you can turn opportunity into revenue or even where you can just offer legitimate business help. I would advise leaders to deliver on this as well. Every day, our chief revenue officers, CEOs and VPs need to show an example to their scared troops and be in the trenches leading this from the front line. Relying on your peacetime fuel lines won't cut it. We are seeing heavy reports from a lot of our customers at Connect and Sell at the moment of inbound lead velocity falling off a cliff. And if we are honest, many sales development reps right now won't have the maturity or emotional intelligence yet to cope with crisis-based conversations with stressed out executives who are thinking emotionally. Leaders and senior staff members can turn what these customers are saying into market signals and break through the fog of war in a way your junior staff simply can't. Number four, think about the length of deals and strive for extended terms and multi-year contracts where you can, but also being open to be flexible. Conceptually, longer deal terms should increase stability and help in decreasing monthly or annual churn with your customers, while selling customers, setting customers up for long-term success. Upstream and at a business level, this helps with conversations with your banks, financing vehicles and investors in an attempt to show stability and your value to the market. However, I appreciate that each business model and service is different. So then it's imperative that you understand the cost to onboard and service a new customer so you are not losing money with overly flexible terms, which have the potential to put you on the back foot and dilute your equal business value in the transaction. In some cases, this may mean more money up front to your customer, but not locking in those who have fear, uncertainty and doubt about what happens tomorrow. In summary, show situational awareness, not desperation, and lead every deal with your maximum value. Number five, and in critical, double down on coaching and enablement. 
Think thoughtfully about any current or future hiring and its necessity. Spend time instead on making your existing teams better and more effective and align them to the market conditions. Many of us will begin to realize that headcount coverage model is inconsistent, full of false promises and generally overstated as a growth driver. Moreover, it's remarkably expensive when money is a uh, premium. Technology like Jiminy, Refract, Gong, Chorus, they'll all be an asset to you in helping you scale your coaching efforts. Six, triple down on your tools and technologies. They can be your force multiplier if you focus on how to really squeeze them for their full value. The poker players in a market like this will invest heavily and go harder and faster and start strategically trying to take markets, possibly from you by following this play and simply scaling their technology investments instead of scaling against humans. Seven, think like a business person, not a salesperson. It's imperative that everybody gets into the headspace of CFOs as they will be the people who run companies through crisis. Terms, in particular, will be where CFOs spend their time negotiating and being hard. Generally, all of us in this group have bigger customers whose cost of money is significantly cheaper than yours. So it's imperative that you think through ways to make your team savvier to the wartime CFO and the business mindset and impact. I can't overstate this enough. They are the power behind the throne and you need to be mindful of this in all of your engagements moving forward. This business savviness has a second consequence, that your coaching needs to be focused on ways your service or proposition provides meaningful business impact to your customers. Features, benefits, solution pillars, category language, why me battle cards, they will fast become redundant. Your people need to communicate and get micro commitments to agree on the value throughout the entire sales process. In a potentially zero based budget environment today, can you look honestly into your team and see the people who have the ability to drive that value consistently, as well as drive the budget, which is no longer existent in parallel when most buying is in lockdown. The talk tracks that you coach against need to change urgently to accommodate this new requirement. Number eight, category creators will thrive as they often find new ways to create new types of value. The 2008 recession bore uh, grew up a, a whole bunch of new categories that are now ubiquitous today. Most of the cloud technologies that we operate in, Salesforce.com accelerated its growth because it created a new category. So be aware of the category creators. New pricing, different ways to share risk, consumption models on demand will all catch attention to the aware buyer. Nine, and my last point, second to last point, nine, I will say this very loud for the people in the back. You don't melt if you work more than eight hours in a day. A lot of conversations in this forum focus on work-life balance, but I fear that they will start to shift and dilute in the next few weeks and months. It's a shame, but it's also a fact of war. Your most inspired, motivated and empathetic teammates will treat this like the playoffs or the final stages of the World Cup and really step up. Doing is what, what is needed. Many of your pillars will crumble. This was a common symptom that I recognised when working in the 2008 era with many superstars having their best deals pulled from them and no pipeline to prop them up when their major accounts and deals fell through. Hard work and consistency will matter more than it ever has to your revenue environment. Lastly, be fast. Be really fast. Be fast in every follow-up. Be fast with every promise. Be fast in every function of your sales process. Execute your promises faster and win the trace trust race against your competition. Um, that's a summary of the things that I feel like I learned in, in the recession of 2008. I'm acutely aware that there are different market conditions today and the recession that I grew up in was structural and based on human negligence, not catastrophic potential catastrophic health failings but i think that there are messages there whether or not you like the war and peace allegory which stand up and things that i hope that you can take back into your operating environments tomorrow morning and act immediately i thank you very much Thank you so much, Jerry. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. Hopefully um, some key takeaways for us to help our audience. Now, next up, we have Geraldine Joquin. She's a business owner for Mind Your Business. Now, Geraldine helps organizations put stress prevention at the heart of their business. 
because when employees are healthy and happy, they perform to the best of their abilities. Her talks and workshops are designed to engage people in their personal stress management, which enables them to move from suffering to get help to self-managing their own stress levels and well-being and that of their teams, all of which results in a more cohesive workforce with better productivity, reduced absenteeism through sickness and lower staff turnover and a more successful business. With a corporate career in international marketing spanning more than 20 years, she brings together her own experiences with training as a clinical psychotherapist, specializing in work-based stress management rooted in the latest neuroscience. In December, she gave a TEDx talk, Why You May Inevitably Become Your Parents, and is author of the book, Understanding Your Stress Footprint. She is currently writing her second book, Creating Your Lucky Loop, based on the hunting part of the brain and planning a book on the adventure in building resilience. So she's definitely keeping herself busy. And so I'd like to welcome Geraldine, our fourth speaker, with her speech title, The Building Blocks of Resilience. Thanks very much for that uh, introduction, Claire. And it's great to be following on from Owen and Jerry's fantastic talks. Now, um, I wrote this talk uh, back in December before we kind of had this uh, situation that we're in now um, and um, I extracted parts of that speech to, to come up with the talk for tonight and it seems um, to me that it's even more uh, relevant today in these particularly challenging times. I love a challenge now, back in my previous career, I spent a great deal of time shadowing salespeople in various countries, from Norway to South Africa, India to Uruguay, Russia to Australia. I was an international market manager representing my brand in these countries across the world, putting together sales and marketing plans, promotions, launches, helping our distributors to sell more of our products. And being on the ground, seeing the market in action, the products on the shelves was an important aspect of that. Now, if I were to describe these salespeople, they were invariably warm and chatty, knowledgeable about their customers and their product portfolio. And it was a tough category, sold into a variety of outlets from huge major multiples to the corner shop. The space was at a premium on the shelves. And it was also a product that went through bubbles, a kind of feast or famine um, situation. Now, one salesperson stood out for me. I love a challenge, she said, as we headed into a news agent's down some back alley in uh, Dublin city centre. She'd been working in sales for under a year, having migrated out of the office, pushing for a chance to try something different. And she was succeeding in a tough environment. She had something. Now, she clearly loved what she did. She actually relished going into the retailer that pushed back, even more so than the ones that were easy wins. She enjoyed building a relationship, breaking down their barriers. It felt like a proper win. She had resilience in abundance. And that resilience is something that we could all do with, especially at the moment. So what is resilience? How do we develop it? It's that ability to cope with problems and setbacks, to be able to use our skills and strengths to get through challenges, to recover and to push forwards again. Now, I love this quote from Nelson Mandela. Do not judge me by my success. Judge me by how many times I fell down and got back up again. Because that describes resilience. Now, resilient people are more likely to experience the positive emotions, things like happiness, joy, pleasure. They tend to be socially connected, to be more outgoing and embrace new challenges, new experiences. And when they're under pressure, they have a tendency to cope better, even expand and grow. That kind of describes most of the salespeople that I met around the world. Whereas people who are less resilient are more likely to experience negative emotions like sadness, anxiety, jealousy. They have a tendency to hunker down in times of adversity, unable to see past the stresses. So it certainly sounds like a trait that's worth developing. There are three key elements in developing resilience. Now, firstly, failure, not in avoiding it, but rather in rebounding from it and learning from the experience. 
next stress. Again, not in avoiding it, but embracing it, using it to propel you forwards. And lastly, understanding your unique attributional style, your own perceptions, and most importantly, your attachment to outcomes. So firstly, let's take a look at failure. Now, we learn as much, if not more, from our failures as we do from our successes. It's a building block if you want to promote resilience. And failure is a bit like catching a cold. If you uh, were brought up in a sterile environment, you never caught a cold or picked up a bug as a child, your immune system would not be prepared for life outside that bubble. So when you do eventually step outside, you finally catch that cold. It's going to feel like the worst cold ever. It might even be life-threatening. Your immune system will be overwhelmed because it hasn't developed any resistance or resilience. But... If as a child you played in the mud, you interacted with other children, if you ate that bit of food that fell on the floor, you are going to be fine. So embrace the things that might cause you to fail. Because when you do that, when you embrace the unknown, take risks, maybe even suffer some hardships, you start to build resilience. And that's when you move from coping in life into thriving. Now, my salesperson in Dublin did this. She took each pushback, each failure and learned from it. She used it to adjust, adjust her pitch, to refine it, to get better. And it can't have been easy at first either. Like that Mandela quote, she would have fallen down several times and had to get back up again. Now, next up is stress. We often think of stress as something that stops us in our tracks, that freeze, flight, fight response that causes us to fall into things like anxiety, depression, procrastination, anger, unable to see past the stresses. But stress is also a promoter of action, pushing us on to achieve bigger and better things. If you can reframe things as a challenge and not see it as an obstacle, you activate your challenge response. The symptoms are the same, a raised heart rate, narrowed vision, all getting you ready for that freeze flight fight. But this pushes you to action. You run towards a challenge. And stress is physical. That raised heart rate, changes in breathing patterns, temperature, tension in muscles, churning stomach, all of which are very similar to feelings of excitement which is where your challenge response lives. So by taking on challenges that push you out of your comfort zone, you prepare your mind and your body. If you never go through any hardships, any stressful moments, any discomforts, then the moment you do, and if it happens to be a big one, you will surely be swallowed up by it. So understand your stress response, how that stress can be used to propel you forwards, not hold you back. Instead of thinking what's the worst that can happen, ask yourself what's the best that can happen. And that brings us to the last element, your attributional style. Now think of this as the lens through which you view the world. And this is a big element of resilience. It's about your own thoughts and behaviours that feed into your feelings. Whether they're the positive ones, happiness, joy, pride, pleasure, or the negative ones, anger, sadness, jealousy. There are three aspects to your attributions now, how personally you take things. Secondly, how permanent you perceive them to be. And thirdly, how much they impact across your life. And it's all wrapped up in your attachment to the outcomes. Now, once you've given your pitch, once you've sent that proposal, you've finished that meeting, you've given your best to secure the deal, can you move on from whatever happens, whatever the outcome is, whether it's success or failure? Because once you've given your best, you have to let it go without investing in the outcome that is really out of your hands. So your building blocks of resilience embrace risks, celebrate your successes, learn from your failures, understand your unique stress footprint, what your triggers are, what helps to prevent stress overwhelming you, and the strategies that you can use um, when you are feeling the pinch of stress. And finally, don't attach to the outcomes. Do your best and then send it on. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Geraldine. Really, really, really useful tips, especially in times like these. So thank you. Now our final speaker for this evening is Travis Henry. He is COO from SalesSource. Having spent his career operating in every part of the revenue generation chain, Travis is uniquely equipped to help clients accelerate their growth trajectory trajectories. He currently leads the consulting practice at SalesSource, advising sales and marketing leadership on the people, process and technology necessary to building successful revenue operations. Previously, Travis led the sales development team at Blue Wolf, the top global consulting partner of Salesforce that was acquired by IBM in 2016. After holding roles in go-to-market planning and marketing operations, he started his career in Oracle's Sales Academy, first hitting the phones as an SDR and later selling enterprise database solutions to emerging startups. He received his BA from UC Berkeley, where he graduated Phi Beta Kappa with high honors. And his title for his speech this evening is Smarter Outbound, how technology is changing the game. So please join me in welcoming Travis to the stage. Hello, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Claire. Um, certainly interesting times that we're living in right now. And uh, I think everything with coronavirus has become much more real over the past few weeks. Um, I know that I'm dialing in here from the San Francisco Bay Area, and we've just been placed into uh, a three-week shelter in place uh, in our home. So uh, very much coming um, into our daily lives. And in a consulting capacity, uh, we've had sales leaders and revenue leaders reaching out to us over the past uh, several weeks asking, you know, what should we do about this? Um, how do we change our operations and how do we change our go-to-market? And I think one of the key pieces um, or a couple of the key pieces that have stood out to me having those conversations is that uh, to Owen's point, um, you can't stop selling. Business can't stop moving forward. It's just going to fundamentally change um, some of the strategies and the tactics that we're using to go to market and continue building the business um, given these macro circumstances. Uh, and there's two kind of initial tactics that I would take if I was sitting in seat as a revenue leader today, thinking about you know tomorrow morning when I go into the office or when I get online with my team, uh, what is the what are the uh, tips and guidance that I can give to my team? What are the actions I can take immediately? And what we know for certain is that inbound is going to fall off dramatically. Um, obviously events is the biggest piece of that and that tends to be a huge lead driver for most of the companies that we work with. So I would uh, meet with my marketing team, look at the lead forecast and really get to truth about where are we going to drive demand over the next uh, months, uh, quarters, and where is the shortfall going to be on our inbound side. Uh, the other thing that I would do is get to truth in our pipeline. So I, I think there's a, a tendency for sales reps and individual contributors to be optimistic about their opportunities in their pipeline in any given period. And that's just a universal truth. Uh, right now, what I would do is make my sales team very comfortable to share with me exactly uh, what is happening within their deals and to get to that by encouraging those sales reps to have conversations with their customers and to really understand you know, what, how has their buying process changed? What has happened with procurement? Uh, what are the different impacts of the coronavirus on uh, their buying behavior? And something that's happened across our client base actually is unsurprising. Pipelines are shrinking um, and uh, forecasts are coming down. And the biggest uh, pivot that we've seen and the thing that remains true is the focus on outbound. And what's key to great outbound is uh, really knowing your customer, knowing your prospect and providing value to them. Um, 
And I think one of the most important things as you think about your outbound strategy today in this environment is approaching it with a sense of empathy, right? Really communicating and showing that you understand uh, there's a broader context here that's affecting your buyers, that um, you know they may not be able to make decisions quickly, that um, there's a, an atmosphere of fear, um, but then ultimately really focusing on what is our messaging that we're bringing to market and how are we really solving problems and making lives easier for our prospects um, even in this time. I know that uh, one of the key pieces to enabling your team to do that is giving them the right technology and giving them the right tools so that you know they're able to deliver a great customer experience to your prospects um, even in this time. And I know back in my early days in my first sales job, um, I remember when I, I came into the office on the first day, I was given a spreadsheet with all of the potential prospects that I needed to reach out to, uh, their phone number, their email, and then the notes that had been left by my predecessor. Uh, There's absolutely no tools or technology in place to help me do my job. And it made it really, really difficult um, to provide a great customer experience and to provide value to, to my end prospects. And the good news is that today, technology gives us an unbelievable opportunity to add more value in our outbound and to be more empathetic to our prospects. Um, one of the key things that I would focus on today in terms of outbound is uh, if you have a sales engagement platform like Sales Loft or Outreach, really taking a step back and inviting in your marketing leaders, your product experts, any other SMEs that you have within your company and taking a fresh look at what is the messaging that we are bringing to market and how are we really speaking to the pain um, and the challenges that our prospects are facing. And I think now there's no better time than now to bring value to those customers um, and to really just give it all away and to uh, be consultative and to be teaching. Um, one of my favorite books is the challenger sale, uh, which is all about how do we really inspire and tailor and ultimately challenge our customers to think differently? And I think if companies today can do that from an outbound perspective while remaining empathetic, uh, they'll be better off for it. Another piece that I would focus on today is taking a fresh look at who is your ideal customer profile and what is your target account list? Hopefully everyone who's on this broadcast uh, has a sense of you know, who our ideal customers are and what are the characteristics that make up uh, those accounts. I think today we need to do more with less, right? You might be thinking about hiring freezes or restrictions on headcount growth. Um, the idea of spending the right amount of time and the right focus on the right accounts is more important than ever. Um, so again, I would look at what is our target addressable market, which verticals uh, do we do best in, what are the specific buyer personas we should be approaching within those accounts, and how do we start to really get a sense of prioritization around those companies. And outbound is phenomenal because you can pick the perfect accounts to go after where you can um, provide uh, the perfect message and you can convert those accounts that will not only you know, convert initially, but they'll renew and they'll expand. And something that helps uh, teams do that today is really understanding what are the signals coming out of accounts? How do I know it's the right time to reach out to this particular company, um, knowing somewhat that they're in market, uh, that our message will resonate? And the very bare bones uh, version of that is as simple as using a Google alert. Right? So having your team go out and set up alerts for uh, the keywords of either your competitors or your solution or the problem you solve and having those proactively pushed to your sales team. So again, they can prioritize their time and they can focus on the accounts that are most likely to convert. Another big piece that's become critical for outbound is the notion of signal and intent data. So if you're using a, a vendor like Bombora or Sixth Sense, um, 
or even if you haven't heard of these vendors before, I would argue that now is the best time to think about uh, signal and intent data. And for those that aren't familiar with this, it's effectively the ability to uh, identify and monitor your target accounts and to understand when they are searching for keywords or other indicators on the internet that relate to your product or your value proposition. Um, absolutely the time to focus on uh, that prioritization effort and that effort to focus. Um, the final piece I'll say is that, um, you know, to Gary's point, tripling down on uh, technology is, is absolutely critical and thinking about, you know, data vendors, whether that be Clearbit or Zoom Info, um, just understanding what does that target addressable market look like? How can we start to go outbound? And again, ultimately bring empathy and a focus on the value proposition uh, to those accounts. So thanks for having me on. Thank you, Travis. Um, thank you for your speech. So thank you to all of our speakers. If you could all join back to the stage and then we'd like to ask some questions from you. So please, if you've got any questions for our speakers, just let us know in the chat. Speaker who you're asking and uh, your question. So we have one from Dominic. So in these times, Travis, what would you consider to be key and topics that people should have access to? It's a great question. I think what's emerged as kind of the core outbound prospecting tool of the last three to four years is sales engagement platform. So it's outreach or sales loft if you have a sales development team. Uh, we've also seen emerging interest in kind of lower cost, lighter weight solutions like Mixmax and Groove, particularly if you have a full cycle kind of inside sales team that's doing both the prospecting end, but also the closing of deals. Um, I would say that's absolutely a must have. And then again, the uh, signal and intent data providers have become very much key for, uh, for outbound. Thank you for sharing, thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions? Did any of you have any questions for each other? I know you are all cheering each other on in the backstage chat, so um, it's a lovely atmosphere and everyone did really, really well tonight. Yeah, I've got a question for Geraldine, actually. Um, I, I love the sort of concept of resilience and mental toughness. How, how can you coach for it? Can you measure it? Can it be a sort of pre-determining factor when you go through an interview process to see whether or not you can forecast success or, or otherwise? Yeah. Yeah, do you know, in this day and age, when people are going for interviews, there's much more of a leaning towards the person as a whole. So not just whether they've got the skills, the academic uh, qualifications, but what else is there? What else behind that? You know, what else are they participating in? What are they going for personally? You know, are they joining you know, the choirs or going to... Um, you know, doing uh, boot camps and all these things, you know, how much are they actually embracing beyond the workplace? Because that shows an interest and excitement in life, which they will then pull into the workplace. Uh, and obviously it's unique to each, um, you know, sort of industry. It may be that within the tech industry that, you know, they're interested in obviously the things that they're working on, but there may be other things around that. It doesn't mean that they have to be, you know, going on and doing tough mothers and all the rest of it outside. But it's just what has, what is their rounded personality? Because how they fit in a team is absolutely getting to the point that's more important than whether they've got the skill or the education now. Because you can train those things, but you can't really train that kind of Willing towards things, wanting to go out there and get things. So I hope that helps. Oh, that's useful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we've got a question for Jerry. Great insight to your experience of the previous crisis, says Alex. Um, how are you dealing with objections related to the crisis and postponing business? Um, 
so we spent quite a lot of time together as a group at the end of the last week to figure out ways that we could be a lot more mindful about how people are perceiving the, the reality of the business situation. And we kind of segmented every B2B company into sort of three camps. The first is almost like a shutdown and see how it goes model. The next is, well, we kind of need to do something, but we don't know how to do it because this is so unusual to us. And then the third is the people that are placing a premium on being able to create opportunity out of chaos. Um, I think the biggest thing realistically is if you lead with empathy and you, and as you know, Connect and Sales a phone acceleration platform. So conversations are everything to us. Um, if you lead with value and empathy attached and actually ask people how they are instead of positioning product as the core first thing that you engage somebody with in an ambushed phone call you're actually going to have and we've got the data much longer much more robust much higher quality conversations with your addressable market i think the other reason why i care deeply about voice in this scenario is that it's just the number of bits that it takes to build trust in an email is something like a hundred thousand bits to build trust between you and me and somebody else, right? A complete stranger. There's about ten thousand bits of information in an email, which is about a hundred emails for somebody to trust you more than they trust themselves. A phone call where you can inflect tone, empathy, compassion and come up with thoughtful and interesting perspectives on what's happening around you in the market. If you've got that maturity and that that sort of tolerance and patience, I think you can go quite a long way. So it no longer becomes about objections. It becomes, why are you asking that question? What are you scared of? How can I help? And I think that that's definitely the tone that, that we've adapted to in the past 10 days of, of working through this. Thank you. Um, so we've got another question for Owen. Um, how are you finding running a remote team? A lot of talk tr of trusting the workforce. Um, how is that when you tra transition with that? Yeah, good question. So um, <clears throat> it's interesting because we we've, we've heard people talk about engagement and uh, and culture, and I've I've for years been banging on about the value of getting people to buy into your business, um, investing in your salespeople's careers, investing in your salespeople's uh, individual development and why that will pay off for you. Um, in normal times, I still believe it pays off for you, but even more so now, it does. So I had a great call with some of my, uh, my team and my team leaders today, and I've been amazed by how they've stepped up and they, um, through adversity, have, have taken the challenge on and they are, in some cases, more positive than we are at times. Um, and that's because we've worked hard for a long, long time to get their buy into us and our mission and our values and who we are as an organization. And this is this is their journey. This is their, this is their business as much as it is ours. And as a result, we're now seeing that payoff from all of the energies and efforts that we put into that that focus and that that, that approach in good times. Um, so from our perspective, the technology is key. We're lucky enough to have, uh, to have had remote workers anyway at times. And, um, and so the technology stack is there and that works really well for us anyway. Okay, it hadn't been road tested until last week en masse. That's been a real learning curve. And naturally there are always teething issues with that sort of thing. But on the most part, it's been great. We've actually seen some higher productivity levels from some people because naturally on a sales on a sales team, there are other distractions in the office, and at the moment, there's very little to distract them. Um, and we're doing some uh, some really innovative things, um, as I can see on LinkedIn and uh, and things like that. But other people are around helping people to stay engaged. So video has been a really key tool for us in doing the normal celebrations and recognition and rewards for people who are getting great results. Um, and instead of just a little email to say, hey, well done, back to Jerry's point about how that's received and tone and information, they're getting personalized videos from the managers and the, 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 peop the people who manage their managers. And we're really making an effort to stay as connected as we can. But I have to say, it is far easier for us because we've invested in people for such a long time before this. And had we not done that, I think it would be really hard to, to, to get that natural trust and that, that organic buy-in from people to do the right thing. Can I chip in on that, please, Claire? Thank okay. you, Owen. Can I chip in on that, please? Um, 
sometimes, but it sounds like you're doing all you can to, to um, oh, go. Mm. Um, come together against this. Um, Jen, for you, uh, the greatest opportunity you see coming out of the chaos? Coming out of the chaos is, you know, this is a time to build resilience. It is a big challenge time. Um, and it is about being flexible. And actually, this is the time where people find out their strengths. Because we're in times of everything's going fine, it's all comfortable, we just kind of do the stuff that we've always done because it works and we kind of just always do it. Um, but it's when you hit blocks that you have to start being innovative in the way you think, you have to think around it. So it actually is a time for people to flex. It's a time for them to, uh, I mean, there's that whole thing of saying, think out of the box. That's because I'm old, Jerry, so, you know, it's, uh, uh, so thinking outside, not, not, not the stuff you've always done, but looking at different ways of um, doing it. And um, perhaps reaching new markets as well. You know, everybody is now going online. My own business is to do with training. Not generally, that is in-person training. Um, but of course, we can't go into businesses and businesses are not gathering together. So it is about using technology. Um, and that actually might end up being a greater thing for my business long term because suddenly then location isn't an issue. If I'm not having to go to London or into my local you know, areas, um, I don't have to step on a plane anywhere, but I can reach other countries. So it, it opens up some opportunities. So it's about not thinking of it as a block or an obstacle, but thinking of it as a challenge, thinking around it and what can you do to flex around it. Yeah, changing the way you think about it. Thank you. Um, so a question to everyone. So if we start with uh, Jer um, yeah, Jerry, what was this lesson this week? Um, I think it's adaptability. You know, there's quite a lot of awesomeness in the human spirit that I've I've definitely sort of re appreciated in the past sort of five to six days. Um, a couple of really interesting and fun examples. Um, I hosted an open Zoom yesterday for eight development leaders, and we had eight people join in, and we created a worksheet together for an hour and a half for. What are your concerns, challenges? How do you build value? How do you get through this? What are your tools? How do you identify mental health issues? So with eight different sets of brain power, we were able to come up with something that was quite comprehensive and interesting and introduce people to each other in a new way of working. Um, one of my friends suggested to me the other day that we have a virtual pub. Let's stand up a Zoom at six o'clock on a Friday evening and go to the pub like we normally would, but we'll just have pints at home. There's all these little snippets of human loveliness that are coming out of this. Um, I think the continuity piece at the business level is the key one, right? Virtually everybody who's invested in sales confidence, it can't be anything other than business as usual. It has to be business as unusual because it's the future health of your companies. If you're pre-revenue and funded, it's okay. If you're a big enterprise company with masses of money in the bank, great. But there are a lot of us that have got six months of cash flow. That's it. So everything we do today is future health of your business. And and one of the things that I'm seeing on my LinkedIn community, my customers, is like Owen. It's this blitz mentality about let's just keep going. Let's what's the alternative? Let's just be brilliant and just continue to do our jobs. What's the alternative? That's what I've taken out of this. I would love to get in the in the pub on a Zoom call. I think that's a great idea. You switch beer to red wine from there. Um, Travis, how about you? What would be the biggest lesson that you've learned this week? Do you think? Yeah, I think uh, it's it's not necessarily a sales and marketing related lesson, but I think just the lesson of uh, gratefulness because I think we were you know, in a, a period of a lot of comfort and, you know, great booming economy and all of that over the last um, s several years, many years. And I think now 
you know, you become way more appreciative and grateful for super simple things like to know, you know, your mom is safe and healthy and hasn't been affected, you know, health wise from this. And, um, you know, personally for us, we're a remote business first. Um, we always operate remotely. So knowing that it hasn't been as big of an impact on us business wise um, and just being really, really grateful for that, I think is, has been awesome. And then I've, I think to Jerry's point, I've been feeling those bits of humanity kind of come out and people kind of supporting each other and banding together in really interesting ways um, over the last couple of weeks. Um, whether that's, you know, volunteering just to give free advice that maybe you otherwise wouldn't, um, or, you know, just sharing best practices or what your experience is. I think it's been uh, a really interesting and kind of humbling time uh, around just being grateful for what we have. So I think that's been my biggest lesson. Mm -hmm. I think that's definitely really important. Be appreciative and be grateful. Thank you. Um, Owen, um, what's the greatest opportunity that you see coming out oh, of this? Uh, good question. Um, Strong word, chaos. Look, I think whenever there's whenever a landscape is harder to succeed in, um, people stand out. And, uh, you know, if you're one of those people that does heed the advice that, that, that that's come from today and uh, take the opportunity, it's an opportunity for you not just to be a, a, a great salesperson uh, or individual contributor or sales leader amongst other good ones, but a great one amongst people that many that are failing. Um, and I think, you know, what I, I thought I was going to get thrown the uh, question about um, what I've learned in the last week and, and to, to tie that back in. Um, the one thing that I've learned is that you have a choice. You have a choice around your mindset in a scenario uh, like this. So you can choose to be defeated by it as it begins um and that's a mindset and if you think that it's not going to work and you're going to fail and all your pipeline's going to go and nobody's going to close and nobody's going to buy from you then that's what will happen um and if you believe that you'll get through it and if you are resilient and if you do everything you can to make it work, work the chances are it will so tying tying back both those questions together the opportunity here is to make a choice to make a choice as to whether you are going to let this burn you let you this hurt let you let this um kill you and kill your career and kill your business or whether you are going to stand up ride the ride the wave that is going to be tough and we all recognize that it, it can be tough and be the one that's there at the end standing up with it with everybody's applauding for having done so well and that is a choice it's not uh it, it's not down to anything other than you so what, if anything, there's a greater opportunity to stand out and to really set yourself up for a huge step in your career or in your business's acceleration by being the ones that stand out in this in this environment. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think, yeah, it's great to have a positive spin and it's so mm. important, your mindset on anything and any problem you can achieve it. Uh, I love this question. So, um, Geraldine. What would you say is the greatest opportunity that, that you I think the greatest opportunity is, is I agree actually with Owen, is, is this choice. It's, it's stepping back and understanding that you don't have to accept you know, other people's idea of what it is. You know, the media, I have to say, is, is coming out every day with, with negative stuff. You know, you have a choice of whether you feed into it or whether you just pick the relevant points and then turn it off because it's practically 24 7. Um, so, yes, stay abreast of news, but don't, don't kind of feed into it and go down into this spiral of negativity because that's only going to be detrimental to you. Um, and also, this idea, you know, don't assume anything. So don't assume that you know we all know what's going to happen. Actually, nobody knows at the moment. So, so just take one day at a time. That, that sort of um, exactly what Travis said. You know, being grateful of what you have now, and accept it in. You know, really, um, you know, be grateful for it, and then you know, don't assume what's going to come tomorrow because it, it's a different day. And, moment the pace of change is so quick it is so quick um there's a lovely quote i can't remember who who said it but you know the winds of luck 
are always there. You just have to set your sails to catch them. So that's that choice, that's that being defeated or looking up, keeping your head up, your vision up, your you know, your options open and seeing what you can catch with it. That's a really good quote. I'll keep that one. Mm. So um, Travis and Jerry, I'd like to ask you the same question. So Travis first, what do you think is the greatest opportunities come out of this? Have some positivity. Yeah, I think um, a little bit related to what I mentioned in the speech, which is uh, your ability to really refocus on your business and refocus on what is important in your business. Um, I think it's easy for a lot of companies in good times to get away from really the fundamentals. And that is, you know, who is our buyer? Do we really understand them? Do we speak their language? And ultimately, What's the message we're bringing to that buyer um, in a value-added way? Um, you know, I really love the uh, the concept that Josh Braun put out, which is uh, making deposits instead of withdrawals, and make a lot of deposits before you make a withdrawal. Um, it's such a simple concept, but I think companies can, you know, for lack of a better word, get a little bit lazy in in times when you know pipelines building, business is doing good, etc now it's almost a sobering moment where revenue leaders and companies can refocus and refocus on uh, their buyer and on their value uh, because i can tell you if a company has a shrinking budget and they want to freeze procurement um, they're not going to they're not going to move forward with you unless you're able to demonstrate value and give value um, so I, I think it actually is an opportunity to refocus in a lot of ways mm 